It's a happy day in hell, at least if you're watching it on TV. After years of waiting, Has Been Hotel has gone from an ambitious YouTube pilot to a full-fledged Amazon Prime series. Nice work, Vivzy Pop. With a first season of eight episodes and hopefully more to come, the show's universe has already been expanded exponentially. So let's talk about the colorful cast of characters that inhabit the underworld. Which of Hell's residents are the least fit for their environment? Let the slaughter begin. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this is Has Been Hotel Season 1 Characters, Good to Evil. Now, let's start with our first category. If we were in charge, these characters would have a spot in heaven. These characters are the good, and we have to give the gold medal of good as a special treat to the pets of the Has Been Hotel. Fat Nuggets, Kiki, Razzle, and Dazzle. Sure, they don't have a major role in the series by any means. That is, unless you count Razzle and Dazzle helping Charlie and Vaggie in the final battle as their noble steeds. But while they aren't the most complex characters, they're the most pure and wholesome for sure. They're always there to comfort their owners. Whether it's Fat Nugget's concern for Angel after a hard day, to Razzle and Dazzle providing tissues for Charlie during a good cry session. That sort of companionship means the world to a lot of people. So we'd say that these creatures are about as pure as you can get in hell. Next up, the silver medal of good has to go to our first resident of heaven, Emily. She's a high-ranking Seraphim Angel who resides in heaven, welcoming newcomers along alongside St. Peter and Sarah. I go by whatever. <laughs> Welcome to heaven. Emily is everything you would expect from an angel in heaven. Sweet, open-hearted, and willing to speak out against injustice. When Adam accidentally reveals his genocidal actions against the demons of hell, she's absolutely revolted, even further so by Sarah's approval, and shows major support for Charlie's plan to help redeem the sinners. Thankfully for her, she was in for a very welcome surprise in the grand finale, but more on that later. For now, we have to give the bronze medal of good to the main character herself, Charlie Morningstar. Really, everything we said about Charlie in our Good to Evil on the pilot episode still applies here. She's an incredibly compassionate ruler who's so determined to make the people around her happy that she struggles to take full advantage of her royal status. The first step to becoming a better person is to admit when you are wrong. Charlie works herself to the bone to help her hotel's residents redeem themselves and get a chance at heaven. Her mercy is definitely her best character trait. She's extremely forgiving from accepting Vaggie despite finding out about her true identity to giving Sir Penius a shot at redemption and a new friend, and even to telling her dad to stop beating the absolute tar out of Adam. Though one could argue that's one of her less good moments, as the dude had it coming. If we had to say anything negative about Charlie, it would be that in her efforts to please the people around her, Charlie often makes things worse, like when she tried to convince Valentino to give Angel the day off, which only made Angel's day and workload significantly worse. Despite this, Charlie is always well-intentioned and works hard to help save her people from a terrible fate, though there was that one time she chased that YouTuber verbally. Oh wait, that wasn't canon. That was just the dark side of the internet. Never mind. Let's quickly mention St. Peter. He's the MC at the Pearly Gates who greets those who approach and lets them know whether or not their names are on the list. When he's given the okay by Sarah and Emily, he not only invites Charlie and Vaggie into heaven, but gives them a full-on musical number. Now that's going above and beyond, which I guess makes sense for heaven, of all places. Rounding out our top five is Sir Pentius. This goofball secondary antagonist from the pilot made his grand return and had quite the character arc, as you can probably tell from his very different placement. I have to go home and study. After being used as a mole by the V's and caught by Angel, Sir Penius left his fate in the hands of the hotel. And thankfully, instead of death, Penius was offered a second chance through one of the absolute sweetest musical numbers you'll ever see. Throughout the season, he slowly breaks his habits of building super weapons and plotting world domination to become a true friend to his buddies at the hotel, always being supportive and helpful wherever he can be. This can range from him tearing up at how sweet Charlie's reunion with her father was to being generous enough to not only buy drinks for every everyone at the club, but to have sex with everyone at the club. He did it to try to pick up Cherry, but it's still a valiant effort. What cements him having such a high position, of course, is his ultimate sacrifice in the final battle, using his death ray slash blimp thing to try and hit Adam with all he's got, regardless of the danger. It was devastating when he got vaporized, then he popped up in heaven, proving that Charlie's hotel does work, and that he absolutely nailed his redemption arc. Moving on to Charlie's girlfriend, Vaggie. Among other bits of lore, season one made sure 
sure that there was zero doubts about these two and their relationship status. And Vaggie's loyalty to Charlie and her plan is definitely her best character trait. She is a ride or die in every sense, always being supportive of Charlie's hotel, and doing what she can to help even when she thinks her plans are frankly insane. That said, a major character twist for Vaggie loses her a few points. Said twist being that she was once an extermination angel, who was cast out for sparing a demon child and rescued by Charlie. But it makes for an interesting start to their relationship. She was more of a soldier than anything, and she ultimately got kicked out of heaven for sparing a child. Which, I mean, it's not a very heavenly decision, guys. And at the end of the day, Vaggie's heroic deeds far outweigh her evil ones, which earns her a respectable spot in the good section. And speaking of which, we've talked about a regular angel and a fallen angel. Now it's time to talk about a guy named Angel. Introduced as a sleazy, duply armed porn star, who gets his thrills from every sin in the book, Angel has already shown fantastic progress in a short time at the Has-Been Hotel. In this season, he slowly learns to come out of his shell and be more open about who he is and who he wants to be, instead of hiding behind his celebrity facade. This body is flawless. Everyone wants some of me. The fruits of this are seen in his more selfless attitude towards the people around him, specifically in episode 6, Welcome to Heaven, where we see him acting as an impromptu babysitter for Nifty. He's also proven to be a loyal friend, always willing to stick up for his buddies when push comes to shove. Most notably, he stood up to his boss, Valentino, before a misguided Nifty almost got herself into a very unpleasant job. Sure, he's still got some work to do, but Angel is already making some incredible progress and will probably continue to evolve. But we can't ignore that a lot of his progress comes from his newfound connection with the hotel bartender, Husk. Although he starts the season as stoic and admittedly insensitive as always, Husk proves to be a great asset to the team. He might cause some messes, but he's always there to clean them up, most notably when he causes Angel to storm off from the hotel. He rescues him from being roofied at a club and finds common ground with him due to both of them being owned by a total psychopath. Husk isn't the most outwardly sensitive guy around, I mean, his whole musical number with Angel was about how they're both losers, but if someone ever needs a listening ear or a good drink, they can count on him when really needed. Oh, and he also helped defend the hotel from genocidal angels, so that's worth some brownie points. Now we get to one of the most powerful overlords in hell, Carmilla. She's a weapons dealer who holds the secret to killing violent angels. That secret happens to be their own weapons, and we're with Vaggie there, how did they not think of that sooner? And Carmilla happens to be so confident in this quote secret, because she herself has killed an angel, in self-defense, of course. Her willingness to protect her people by any means necessary says a lot about her character. That said, she can suffer from tunnel vision, often caring more about her own circle than hell as a whole. She did ultimately teach Vaggie how to fight angels, though. Did you know angels could be harmed? And provided the hotel with plenty of weapons to fight them. So while she's not exactly a saint, she's definitely more good than most overlords by the end of the day. Just like their beloved master, we're giving the Egg Boys a spot in the good category this time around. From Frank to the other guy to the one on the left, he's my favorite, the Egg Boys are simple creatures. They're more than happy to follow the lead of anyone, encouraging and praising them all the way. Not to mention that, much like the aforementioned pets, they offer Serpentius comfort. We rank them a bit lower because the Egg Boys are willing to pretty much just do whatever. That boss? Want me to rub him up for you? They certainly aren't malicious, and they've done a lot more good than bad this season, but we can't fully ignore the fact that they're at least willing to serve evil, if the opportunity presents it. But given how quickly they told Serpentius about Alistair's secret, and I was not supposed to talk about it. They won't do it super competently, which is what earns them the Darwin Medal. Now, rounding out our good section, we have Lucifer Morningstar. He's easily the most shocking in terms of where he ended up on our list. Charlie's phone call with her mom's voicemail and the pilot sort of gave off the vibe that Lucifer was a distant parent by choice. But boy, did we miss the mark here. Lucifer's distance from his daughter was more of a result of his split with Lilith, which drove him into a deep depression where he found it difficult to do anything but create brilliant rubber duckies. He may not have been the most present in Charlie's life, but for a guy named Lucifer who resides in hell, he's sure a heck of a lot nicer than you would expect. From the get-go, Lucifer is doing his best to make up for lost time with Charlie, offering her sincere advice and support despite his own reservations about the hotel idea. He saves her life from Adam in the grand finale and has really proven himself to be genuine in supporting Charlie, so hopefully we'll be seeing much more of this overlord in the future. Take your little friends and go home. 
Take that, depression. You can't keep this guy out of the good tier. Now we have to move into our rankings equivalent of purgatory, so to speak. These characters fall in the gray area. First up, we have Tom Trench. He's one of the two co-anchors of 666 News alongside Katie Killjoy. We honestly don't even think he said a full sentence in the season. He was technically there, though. We guess he didn't really do anything wrong. Like Katie said, nobody really cares who he is. But maybe we'll see more from him next season. Zestiel, like Lucifer, ranks kind of shockingly high on our list given his role. He's another powerful overlord who's so terrifying that the other demons shudder or incinerate themselves at the mere sight of him. Even Alistair is kind of uneasy upon seeing him, which should give a good indication of what kind of ruler he is. It has been an age since thou hast graced us with thy presence. That said, surprisingly, Zestiel doesn't seem to be anywhere near a villain. He's calm, polite, and actually pretty sympathetic. When he senses that his old friend, Carmilla, is in trouble, he offers her a listening ear with no strings attached. Though we are still going to rank him in the gray area, given how terrified everyone is of him, and how little we know about why that is. Landing significantly lower this time around is the hotel housekeeper, Nifty. Nifty is, um, what is Nifty? I guess... Imagine Gur from Invader Zim, but with a more stabby side to her character. Nifty might seem cutesy and friendly at first glance, but she's had more than her fair share of questionable traits, like her infatuation with bad boys and, like we mentioned earlier, her tendency to stab things. But Nifty is still generally friendly with the other hotel staff members. She's less evil and more like a toddler who's on cocaine. It's a weird analogy, but it's all I got. Next, we have the cannibal town overlord, Rosie. Despite that admittedly intimidating title, worry not, Rose is actually quite friendly and helpful. Sure, she is a cannibal, but if you can get past that detail, you've got someone who is willing to help Charlie recruit her entire town to help defend the hotel against the extermination. Not to mention offering her free relationship advice. Perhaps this girl was trying to redeem herself too. We're not going to act like she's a saint, but as far as demons go, Rosie is a decent, surprisingly compassionate person. Just, you know, also a cannibal. So obviously we have to give her the gluttony sinner medal, because there's not much of a more sinful way to eat. Landing significantly lower than her young comrade is Sarah. Sarah is the mighty seraphim angel who helps to rule over heaven. She's willing to hear Charlie out about her hotel and is generally shown to be a decent ruler to her people. That said, she is also the one who approved of Adam's plan of genocide against the demons in hell. Keeping heaven safe was my only reason for allowing it. While you could argue she should get some leeway for the fact that she insisted on taking the moral burden of this decision for her people, she still approved of a genocide and lied to her people about it. Pretty sleazy, but at the end of the season, hopefully the redeemed sinner right in front of her face changes her tune. Side note, isn't it weird how much most of these angels hate the idea of redemption? Next up, we have quite the explosive entry, lovable arsonist Cherry Bomb. A loyal friend to Angel, Cherry is always itching for action, whether it's fighting, drugs, sex, or some good old-fashioned pyro techniques. There's never a dull moment. While Cherry is not one to talk about your feelings or the meaning of life with, Come on! What you really need is a recharge! She's definitely someone you can count on when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Or you can just hand her a stack of cash and she's reliable. Alistair's old pal, Mimsy, is the last character in our gray area. She's one of the less major characters, only appearing in a single episode, but she's definitely made a mark. Note, the mark was not good. Mimsy visited the hotel mid-musical number to ask for Alistair's help with some trouble, as she apparently does often. Thanks for helping little old me out of a tough spot. Although Alistair doesn't mind helping her in a general sense, she manages to overstep his boundaries by bringing a group of dangerous loan sharks to the hotel, placing it and everyone there in danger. Even Alistair was annoyed with her over this, and we can't blame him. We wouldn't call Mimsy evil, but only coming by when she needs to be saved from the ludicrous amounts of trouble she gets herself into is pretty scummy. We know they're bad guys, but you kill the man's girlfriend. That said, it's not quite scummy enough to lock her into our final category. These characters have earned a stay in hell. They are the bad and the evil. Like the gray area, we're kicking this section off with a news anchor, Katie Killjoy. Like Tom, she really doesn't have all that much screen time, but she has enough to remind us that she's just as much of a jerk as always. Look, my time is money, so I'll keep this short. We're not sure we'd call her a full-on villain. Again, she's barely in the season, but her mistreatment of Tom for seemingly no reason is enough to conclude that whether or not she's truly evil, she's definitely just mean. Landing just outside of our top five is the first of the V's, Velvet. Velvet is a celebrity
celebrity social media influencer and fashionista. True to the stereotype, she's mean, snarky, and verbally abuses her employees on a regular basis. The furthest thing from pleasant to be around. She's also quite outspoken about her lack of respect for the overlord's unwillingness to attack heaven, ignoring the clear risks of going in without a plan. The game has changed. We can take the fight to them. While you could argue that, in a way, Velvet is trying to push the overlords to use their authority to stick up for hell, she's still a reckless person who sees anything less than violent assertion as a lack of backbone. We'd say she deserves a Pride Center medal for her own insistence that it's her way or the highway. We only rank her this high because despite her lack of any fully redeeming traits, the final five are definitely more evil, in terms of their deeds if nothing else. And the bottom five kicks off with the last of the has-been hotel staff, the radio demon, Alistair. While he initially hopped on board with Charlie's hotel for the fun of watching her fail, Alistair seems to have grown some kind of fondness for her over the course of the season. He helps defend the hotel from harm on numerous occasions, most notably fighting off Adam and nearly dying in the process. He even uses his connections with other overlords, like Rosie, to help Charlie run her hotel and keep it out of danger. Considered an investment in ongoing entertainment for myself! But while all of these are good traits, we still can't confidently place Alistair any higher because he's just so mysterious. There's no doubt that he's a bad guy. He took down other overlords and broadcasted their tortured screams for his own sick pleasure. And as we see from his treatment of Husk, he's far from a caring host to the souls and his ownership. At least, not when they question him. Our only uncertainty about him is whether or not he's pure evil, or just a more moderate case of evil. Right outside our podium, we have the ruthless extermination angel Loot. As happy as heaven may seem, in this universe there are some less than savory characters running the place. Sarah may have okayed Adam's plan of genocide, but she at least did it for the sake of what she saw as protecting her people. Loot, on the other hand, is totally ruthless in her drive to exterminate the demons of hell, and is closed off to the idea of them having any chance at redemption. Which is still super weird. On top of that, she's also extremely brutal. She has a habit of threatening her opponents with such detailed violence that even Adam, who, spoiler alert, is way worse than her, often has to tell her to chill the hell out. You just, just chill, Luth. Her grudge against Vaggy also earns her a Wrath Sinner Medal. As for her good traits, she does seem to be genuinely heartbroken at Adam's death, showing that she does have something she's genuinely fighting for, which is really grasping at straws, but honestly, any redeeming qualities at all can make her stand out from the podium. The Bronze Medal of Evil goes to the next of the Vs, Vox. Not to be confused with the main villain of the PS2 game Ratchet Deadlocked, but props to you if you get that reference. Vox is a demon who's got a serious rivalry with Adam. Alistair. Actually, rivalry might be the wrong word. It's more like seething hatred. Vox considers Alistair a mortal enemy, wanting to keep Pentagram City's media under his own control via controlling the TV and news, along with some classic hypnosis. He's level-headed enough to keep the other Vs in check during their more impulsive moments, like stopping his on-and-off-again lover Val from attacking the Hasman Hotel on a whim. Vox manages to be even worse than Alistair, due to his own seething rage at the latter being good at anything. Seems like as good a reason as as any to give out the Envy Sinner Medal. He's also quite the sadist watching the has-been hotel staff fight against heaven, and literally getting a hard-on by the possibility of them dying. The Silver Medal of Evil has to go to the first man on Earth, Adam. If you grew up going to Sunday school, you might remember Adam as the first human man who ate an apple that was originally offered up by the serpent, subsequently getting cast out of the garden for disobeying God's literal one command. The details of the story are a little different than has been, but all you need to know today is that Adam is upgraded from, quote, guy who ate an apple he wasn't supposed to, to a high-ranking angel who is basically what would happen if you gave a stereotypical frat bro angelic powers. I'm sure your relationship will be fine. See you in court. Adam is the one who kickstarted the genocides in hell, taking great pleasure in exterminating demons indiscriminately. If that's not bad enough, and it definitely should be, Adam tends to throw temper tantrums that cause him to move exterminations up if anyone questions him. Charlie questioning him at all is enough to make him cut the way waiting time for the next extermination in half. Adam isn't just the jerk he seems to be at the beginning, he's a jerk with no morality and the powers to kill as he sees fit, vaporizing Sir Penius' ship alongside him and his egg boys in a single hit. For that alone, we wish we could give him the gold medal of evil, but there's one character we honestly feel deserves it more. If you've been keeping count, you already know that the gold medal of evil belongs to Susan. Bring Rosie back! 
Susan? Susan. Okay, no it doesn't. We just kind of wish it did though. In all seriousness, the gold medal of evil has to go to Valentino. Adam was a total POS, but if nothing else, he had something adjacent to a reason for doing what he did, keeping hell from getting too big for its britches, so to speak. That doesn't make him any less evil by any means, but he at least had a reason other than pure hedonism. Valentino, on the other hand, is the kind of person hell was really meant for. He may not be causing genocides, but he's an abusive psychopath who thrives on enslaving vulnerable people to act in his porn videos. He frequently assaults his employees, particularly Angel, and may both heaven and hell forbid if you piss him off outside of work. I own you. Or have you forgotten that? Because he'll make you pay for it tenfold the next day at work. Valentino deserves the lust medal for the nature of his work, and we'll also give him the greed medal for his determination to recruit all the poor sinners he can for it. Valentino is a monster in every sense of the word. He doesn't care about anyone but himself, and sees others as objects at best and targets for his own sick pleasures at worst. He's a scumbag in every sense of the word, and we hope that this moth is kept as far from the light as possible.